Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 305 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. Introducing new queens into queenless colonies can sometimes be a tricky job, especially for the inexperienced beekeeper. We've tried several different methods and now focus on making colonies hopelessly queenless before releasing the new queen. Listen in to hear more of this almost foolproof method. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. This week's podcast is sponsored in part by Modern Beekeeping, suppliers of general beekeeping equipment, including high-density poly hives. These include Paradise National Hives, Swenty Poly Hives, and of course, Honey Pour Hives, my particular favourite. More than this, Modern Beekeeping also supply traditional cedar and pine hives, a range of very effective bee feeds called Appy Mix and Appy Pasta, and a full range of all the must-have beekeeping equipment for every beekeeper. For all your beekeeping needs, contact Paul at Modern Beekeeping by visiting their website www.modernbeekeeping.co.uk. Hi everyone, I trust you're all well and managing to get some beekeeping done as we march relentlessly into June and our main nectar flow for the year ahead. It feels like the June gap was a May gap this year, mainly caused by the rather disappointing weather. Certainly right now, especially at the Fishing Lakes apiaries, the brambles are well into their flowering period and all the local pollinators are making a beeline to them. Sorry about that poor attempt at a pun. The weather continues to be cooler, particularly at night. Certainly in the last week, the overnight temperatures have been disappointingly low. Still, no frosts here for me, so I'm a happy gardener at least. For those of you asking, what does he mean by the term June gap? Well, I think I've mentioned it before, but it's the period at which available forage for our colonies suddenly takes a dip between the spring flowering plants ending their flowering period and the start of the main summer flowering period, our main nectar flow and hopefully main honey production period. I always think this time of the year feels a little like the long-awaited start to a special holiday or trip that you've been planning. These special events seem to take an age to get here, but when the day finally arrives, it seems to be a mad rush and it's over in a blink of an eye. It's worth saying that this is why it's so important to be prepared in the late winter period, as we get set for the new season, because once the bees get active, time just seems to run away so quickly. As we head into this busy time, it's worth catching up on where we are. I was going to say exactly, but I think an exact appraisal will have to wait for a couple of more weeks as we're introducing new queens into splits at the moment, and I want to make sure these have all settled before I count colonies. More on the queen introduction shortly, but first, here's my catch-up of where we're at-ish. Nuke sales have been brisk, and actually, we have another nine nukes going out in the next week or two, and then that will be it until next spring. These nukes have come from larger colonies that have been split, and as a result, it has made the part of the hive that's left behind queenless. Thus, it needs a replacement queen. Where we have had split colonies because of that rather annoying early season swarming, we've had mixed results with those queens mating successfully and starting to lay. If you're a regular watcher of my videos, you might have seen the recent video of the three nukes where we had split a colony into one or two frame nukes and left them with a queen cell, a swarm cell that is, to manage. Each of these three nukes had a virgin queen emerge, fly off to mate and return successfully. Now, each of these very small colonies has a strong laying queen and are doing very nicely. The story isn't quite so successful in other splits or colonies where they had swarmed and I cut out all queen cells except for one. 
of a total of around 14 colonies that were left with swarm queen cells in, around seven have failed to mate successfully and had no eggs or brood in when I checked last week. Now, that's getting very late for these queens, certainly compared to the other colonies where they also had a single queen cell. She emerged, flew, and mated successfully. Now, these colonies have several frames of sealed brood, brood in all stages and eggs. These I would consider to be developing colonies, looking good for the high summer foraging, and will no doubt deliver a small honey crop. The apparently failed queens have had no different treatment to the other colonies in the same apiary, and yet those queens have unfortunately failed to mate and are now in danger of possibly becoming drone layers or just never starting to lay. And as a beekeeper, there's nothing more frustrating than watching a previously strong colony suddenly swarm, have a virgin queen emerge, and then you wait and wait and wait. And then you wait some more. You spot the queen so it kind of tells the inexperienced beekeeper that there is a queen in there, so everything will be fine. As the weeks pass, still no eggs, and as adult bees die of old age and hard work, the colony starts to dwindle, and dwindle some more, until eventually all that's left is some very dark, unloved comb, and a very small colony of bees destined to die out. If this has happened to you, I feel your pain. It's happened to me in the past and it's difficult for the inexperienced beekeeper to know when to throw in the towel and get rid of that newly emerged but apparently failing queen and either add more eggs, a queen from another nucleus colony, unite them with another stronger colony or buy in a new queen from one of the many reputable suppliers we now have in the UK. I'm lucky in that I can compare my queenless colonies to each other and spot when new queens in them are laying. This alerts me to potential issues in other colonies where it's perhaps taking much longer for a new queen to start laying eggs. It happened just this week and I found four colonies all with queens yet none had started to lay any eggs. Compared with the little nukes that I mentioned earlier, all of which have mated well and have strong laying queens in them. So these queens that weren't laying had to go. It occurred to me that there was an opportunity for me here. I've never had honeybee queens to dissect under a microscope before. I've always been in too much of a focused rush to get the old queens out and new queens in to remember to grab a queen cage and keep them for later. This week I remembered the bad news is I only remembered once I'd been through most of these colonies and only managed to hang on to two queens in a cage. These have now been humanely culled by putting them into the freezer. It does give me a couple of queens to dissect and might allow me to see if I can find out why they've not started laying. My guess is they never got out to mate given the poor weather conditions we've had recently. We will see, but the pressure will be on to take care when I carry out those dissections and not mess it up with only two samples to have a crack at. Look out for the video later in the year when the beekeeping calms down a little. This brings me on to the replacement queens we've been introducing this week and the various methods that can be employed and the methods that I've employed to attempt to get 100% successful acceptance of these queens into the various nukes, splits and colonies that they've all gone into. I mentioned earlier the process we use of making up a strong nuke for sale from an existing colony, which then leaves the remaining smaller part of that colony queenless. Imagine, if you will, a colony of 10 frames. Doesn't really matter what hive type we're talking about, but as I have Langstroth, we'll go with that. So, a 10-frame Langstroth hive. I remove six frames of brood and food, along with the marked queen, for the nuke that I'm selling. This leaves a box with four frames in it, some brood and bees. But wherever possible, no eggs or young larvae. Frames can be manipulated to take out all the frames with eggs and young larvae, these being the frames that the queenless colony will attempt to produce emergency cells from. 
Of course, it's not always possible, but where I can sort them like this, it makes introducing a new queen very simple. This partial queenless colony gets moved to a different part of the apiary, and the nuke goes back onto the original hive stand to catch the older flying bees. Meanwhile, the queenless nuke-sized remnant loses its flying bees back to the original hive, leaving mostly nurse bees. You will hear a queenless roar within a very short space of time. I leave them like this for a few days, just in case I've missed any eggs or young larvae that the bees want to make a queen cell from. It also means I don't have to do all the moving around on the day the new queens arrive to go into these queenless nukes. Once the queens arrive, I open them immediately, check that they're all alive, and I normally give them a little spray of fresh water. Once in the apiary, I keep these caged queens out of direct sunlight. Also, it's worth saying, don't leave them in the shade of the footwell in your car and then close all the doors and windows for several hours. It really won't do them any good at all. To suspend these cages in the hives, I use cocktail sticks. A good tip here is to buy the wooden ones that have a little hole in the lid of the container so you can shake out a cocktail stick one at a time. I've dropped containers of cocktail sticks so many times and the ones without these holes seem to explode apart and throw little sticks everywhere. And it's never easy trying to pick them up wearing gloves and a bee suit in the heat of a summer sun. In the queenless splits, I then check for any queen cells. Probably around half of all the splits I make seem to find a larvae or egg to have a go at making an emergency queen cell so we do still check them, even though I've convinced myself I've not given them any opportunity to make a queen cell. Once any cells have been removed, it's a simple process of removing the tab and inserting the queen. I use my hive tool to snap off the tab at the bottom of the queen cage. It's located at the end where the fondant plug is. Take care with your hive tool, as a little too much force can see the hive tool slip and catch the sliding back of the queen cage, tearing it off and allowing the queen and attendant workers to escape. These cage tabs usually, and certainly the ones we tend to get and use, have three little connectors holding the main blocking tab in place. You can break a couple and bend the tab back, but I've had occasions where that tab has then folded back on itself and blocked the escape route again, so I like to remove them completely. Put the remove tab in my pocket and more often than not find them days later in the washing machine. Once the tab is removed, the cocktail stick can go through the small eye at the other end and the whole cage can be suspended between two frames with the cocktail stick laying across the tops. This works really well when the hive has enough room for the frames to be spread apart a little, but sometimes, especially if you have a national hive and have forced that extra 12th frame into it, it can be difficult to get that final frame back in. In this case, in the past when we've had national hives, I've suspended the cage midway up a frame where there's a slight concave area. The other alternative is to use your hive tool and just scrape a section back to allow the cage to sit firmly in place. And that's it. Close up the colony and give them a week before going back in to see how things are progressing. More often than not, you'll find lots of eggs and the bees going about their business as normal. If you have a situation where you need to remove the old queen and insert the queen cage immediately, I would advocate leaving the tab in place for a couple of days. Let the new queen's pheromone dominate and then go through the process I've just described. Where I've been through that scenario, sometimes, if time is short, I've simply opened the slide on the queen cage and walked the queen onto the frame. As long as the workers are not obviously attacking the queen, she's usually just fine. It means I don't then have to go back in to remove a cage, but I have had occasion where the workers still hadn't accepted her for whatever reason and had to grab her quickly and pop her back into the cage to save her. There are, of course, lots of different queen cage designs and lots of ways of successfully releasing a new queen into a hive. Whichever way you choose, Good luck with it and fingers crossed for some settled weather as we head towards the summer solstice. 
Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget to check out my website, www.norfolk-honey.co.uk, and for my latest videos and podcasts with more updates, tips and techniques, it's the same Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. And remember, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping short and sweet. Sweet.